1991, a handgun was introduced to the market that has proven to be highly reliable while stepping up pistol performance capabilities that rivaled, if not exceeded, revolvers that fired the most widely accepted Magnum cartridge of the day, the 357 Magnum. This pistol stands apart as the manufacturer's most powerful semi-automatic pistol and which is the oldest 10 millimeter in continuous production. That pistol is the Glock G20, a 10 millimeter pistol that is large, in charge, and which has proven itself worthy of hunting and survival. Hello, this is the Range Ronin. Today's presentation is about the Glock G20 and my impression of it. I am not going to go into the history of the 10 millimeter cartridge, as that has been widely documented, nor Am I going to get into the 40 Smith & Wesson, or 10 mm short, as that has been well documented? The fact of the matter is that when I became interested in the 10 mm cartridge, a Glock pistol was not even considered. My top choice was the Springfield Armory XDM 5.25 competition model. That led me to several 1911-based 10 mm pistols, simply because I have roots with the 1911. So, what finally drew me to the Glock G20? Let's say that it was curiosity. I needed to know if I had really missed out on something that I really should have embraced. I had read articles and viewed videos of G20 reviews, and two negatives stood out. The size of the pistol and an issue with case blowouts. The size factor really did bother me, but the case blowout issue did. For some reason, I prefer a degree of safety when shooting a firearm that chambers a high-performance cartridge. I have had a bad experience in the past with a single-action revolver chambered in 44 Magnum that blew up with factory loads and cost me not only the revolver, but dental work. Further research into the case blowout problem eventually led me to find that the issue was not with the pistol per se, but with those who like to push reloaded or new brass to the upper limits and sometimes beyond. Another factor was, allegedly, poor case support by the chamber. However, a kaboom was highlighted in the article by the truth about guns. I have posted a link to the article in the description section. Two facts were brought out. One, the barrel was not a Glock barrel. And two, the ammunition by Underwood, who identified an undersized projectile that was forced back into the case when chambered and that in turn caused a pressure spike that was beyond the capabilities of the cartridge case. Still, I brushed the G20 aside as not something that I desired. That was until now. Let me just say that after purchasing the Gen 5 G22, I gained enough confidence in Glock's capability to provide a chamber that would adequately support a cartridge that will result in 624 foot-pounds of muzzle energy when sending a 180 grain bullet at 1250 feet per second downrange. By comparison, the 40 Smith & Wesson drops that figure to 400 foot-pounds with its 1000 feet per second of velocity. With the G22, I found no visual or measured indication of case bulge with the ammunition that was fired. While I can't discount the kabooms that happened, after all, there was documented evidence of such. I felt that with the ammunition that I would fire through the G20 would not pose a problem. So, let's take a look at this potent package of a powerful pistol. The G20 is a handful, to say the least. Still, when delivered, and after my hand went around the grip, the thickest of the provided beaver tail grip adapters was installed. I am also a guy who likes thick grips, like that of the Breda 92 M9, SIG M11A1, and Springfield Armory XD series, just to name a couple. I am also the guy who prefers the Arch mainspring housing on a 1911 because of the way the grip feels in the paw. While the thickest of the provided beaver tail grip adapters does add a minuscule of trigger reach, 
actually 0.16 inch, to bring the trigger reach up to 3.01 inches from 2.85 inches. The result is a grip that I can, well, grip completely. This trigger distance places the first joint of my trigger finger near perfect on the face of the trigger and exactly where I want it. The 4.61 inch polygonal rifled barrel is long enough for a good self-defense loading of federal 180 grain hydro shock to exit the muzzle somewhere around 1,069 feet per second, and which can travel out of the barrel of my high point 10 millimeter carbine at somewhere around 1,208 feet per second. By comparison, the 124 grain 9 millimeter hydro shock through the 4.49 inch barrel of the G17 exit somewhere around 1115 feet per second with 56 grains of less projectile weight and as much lower case pressure than that of the 10 millimeter. The 1.12 inch wide slide incorporates rear slide serrations only. Nope, no front slide serrations as found on Gen 5 pistols. Maybe a Gen 5 version of the G20 might have them, but I would not upgrade to a Gen 5 just because of that. The sights on this particular model were standard Glock dot and notch polymer sights. These were changed out at the point of purchase with a set of True Blow TFX Pro tritium and fiber Opti Extreme handgun sights that have become one of my favorite sights for my Glocks and which were also mounted on my EDC, the G48. If you are concerned about weight, just let it be known that 1 pound 7.1 ounces of the slide assembly contributes to the 2.49 pounds of loaded pistol weight. When you pick up a dry G20, first thing that you notice, except grip and slide width, is that the G20 is top heavy. However, slide 15 rounds of your favorite 10 millimeter ammunition into a magazine, plus one in the chamber, and everything balances out. The slide, as normal, houses the barrel, captivated recoil spring and guide, and the normal array of firing pin, striker, extractor, ejector, and backplate assembly. The 5.3 ounces of frame houses the essential safe action fire control system and incorporates a slide lock, left side only slide stop lever, large reversible magazine latch, replaceable back straps in beaver tail style, and a forward mounting rail for lights, lasers, and combinations thereof. The frame also incorporates the three pin arrangement, locking block, trigger, and trigger housing pin, rather than the two pin arrangement found in Gen 5 pistols. I have seen frames crack about the locking block pin, and I will be watching for that closely. The grip length is more than adequate, even for large hands, while the texturing is a familiar side, front, and rear fine diamond pattern. The G20 comes with three 15-round metal-lined polymer-coated magazines that can be disassembled for maintenance and a magazine loading tool that will never replace a good Uplula loading tool. The grip, by the way, does incorporate finger grooves that some like and some do not. While I do not miss them if they are not present, I have come to like finger grooves. While they do not dominate the front strap of the grip, they do provide me with an index for my hand, especially when drawing from a holster. My middle finger just seems to fall into place above that top groove, and which guides my hand to the rest of the grip. My Gen 5 G22 is void of finger grooves, but it seems that I can shoot just as poorly with the G22 without the finger grooves as I can the G20 with finger grooves. Wide grip frame of the G20, as with other wide frame pistols, allows me to place the heel of the support hand fully against the side of the grip. With smaller frame pistols, I always feel like I'm trying to find a trade-off point between space for the shooting and support hand on the grip. 
With the highest hold down the grip that I can obtain, felt recoil is straight back into the web of the shooting hand. And that recoil is sharp, quick, and gone in a whisper. Obviously, more pronounced than the 9mm and 40 caliber chamberings. The recoil has the same type of sharpness, but with more energy. While I have fired the 10mm cartridge and other pistols, the G20 was a different experience as compared to the others. Like the Springfield Armory XDM, which is also a polymer-based striker-fired pistol, the frame absorbs some of the spent energy and dissipates it more than a steel-framed 1911 pistol. It seems to concentrate that spent energy straight back to the shooter's hand and subsequently the arm. Compared to shooting full load 357 Magnums for my 4-inch revolver, I'll take the G20 over it while delivering the same or more energy into a target. The G20 ran everything I could feed it, like the champion it is. Sodier and Bello, Yoki, Hydroshot, and 6-hour Elite Performance Ammunition all ran without a hitch. Inspection of fired cases revealed no abnormalities such as case bulging. Let me briefly mention the trigger. The trigger is typical Glock. There's a slight bit of free travel until the trigger engages. Six pounds, 13.4 ounces later, as measured on my G20 after a five pole average, the trigger brace clean and the striker does what it's supposed to do to a primer. Maintenance on the G20 consists of disassembling the firearm, cleaning and lubrication, reassembly, and function checking. All of this is well documented in both the owner's manual and online videos and articles. In regard to maintenance of the G20, I am only going to say that you should follow a regularly scheduled maintenance program to ensure that it is properly cleaned and lubricated to prevent corrosion and to remove accumulated dirt and debris that can affect the action and operation. Both Glock and I agree that the pistol should be cleaned and lubricated when brand new, before the first time it is fired, plus after each time it is fired. 
plus as required. This will be determined by your pistol's exposure to adverse conditions during storage or use, such as rain, snow, perspiration, salt water, dirt, dust, lint, etc. Additionally, your pistol should be cleaned and inspected if it has been dropped or if any broken parts are suspected or malfunctions experienced. For those who are not familiar with the disassembly, cleaning and lubrication, assembly, and function testing of the pistol, this next segment will show you just how to do that. Take down as quick and as straightforward as any other Glock. Remove the magazine, ensure that the pistol is unloaded and safe. Pull the trigger and then just give the slide a little tension rearward and pull the takedown levers on both sides of the slide down. Release and pull the slide forward to slip it off the frame. Inspection, cleaning, and lubricating the G20, I leave up to you, as everyone develops their own methods of doing such. With that said, I highly recommend that you follow the guidelines and procedures laid out in the user manual to garner the best results. After disassembly, cleaning, and lubricating all the right places, I also check for function using a snap cap, which allows me to check extraction and ejection while protecting the striker when I pull the trigger. One of my primary questions when considering a new handgun is how I'm going to conceal it. The G20 was never intended to be concealed. It was intended as a duty pistol to be housed in a secure duty holster. But there are those of us who, when considering a firearm, question, how are we going to hide the puppy? For some, concealing a pistol the size of the G20 may take some work. For some, it may take a lot of work, and for some, it may take no work at all, because concealing this beast is not on your list of to-dos. For me, concealment comes down to two options, IWB and shoulder. The Alien Gear Cloak Tuck 3.5 IWB holster for the Glock G20 takes care of both behind the hip and cross draw carry for the G22, G21, G30, and other Glock pistols of comparable slide width, 1.2 inches and shorter slide length. In addition, 
the Alien Gear Cloak Tuck 3.5 IWB holster for the Glock G20 also can provide care and concealment for the G17, G19, G45, and other Glock pistols with a slide width of 1.0 inch and shorter slide lengths. The Alien Gear Cloak Tuck 3.5 IWB holster comes with enough spacers and adjustments to custom fit the Glock for ease of accessibility to the pistol while retaining the pistol securely. For a shoulder carry, I went with the Felco Timeless Rotor Shoulders Holster System with counterbalance. I have several Felco holsters, both in hip IWB and shoulder, and have come to trust their holsters. Although for the G20, the holster will also serve to house a G22, G21, G30, or any Glock with a 1.12 inch slide width. In fact, the holster will also house a G17, G19, G45, or any full-size or compact Glock pistol with a slide width of 1.0 inch. In short, two holsters can serve the majority of my Glock pistol double stack carry needs. G20 was one of those pistols I had no need for until I needed to satisfy my curiosity, and it was well satisfied. While my use for the G20 is primarily self-defense, others may see it as a pistol to be used for hunting. The 10mm makes a sensible hunting round, delivering enough energy to take deer, hogs, and black bear at sensible ranges. Others just may need protection when camping or on the trail from nature's most cantankerous four-legged creatures that have no discerning taste when they are hungry, or from nefarious two-legged creatures bent on making your day a life-altering experience. In a pinch, you can shoot the 40 Smith & Wesson in the G20. The problem with shooting 40 in a 10 millimeter is that you are relying on the extractor to maintain headspace. It works most of the time. Problem is, when it doesn't, it is possible that the round could slip forward in the chamber, and yet is still ignited by the striker firing pin. Then you have a cartridge discharging with no breech face support, and can have the primer pop out and or case head rupture. It doesn't happen often, but when it does, it's a major kaboom. For me, I would rather have a dedicated pistol for a dedicated cartridge, rather than swapping components. I rather like the simplicity of design that Glock takes with the pistols. While some claim that Glock pistols are downright ugly, I will say that with some of the new pistols that I have seen, Glocks are really not that bad looking, and I have not had an issue with any Glock pistol that I own. The G20, in my case, rounds out my ownership of Glock pistols in my preferred calibers. I consider the 357 SIG and 45 Gap as specialty rounds and of which I have no desire to own a pistol chambering such. The G20, while a large pistol, is no weightier than the 1911 or the Ruger GP100, yet provides a powerful means to stop a threat, and I have an initial 15 plus 1 rounds to help me out with that, plus 30 more rounds and two spare magazines. One thought has been that the Glock G20 saved the 10mm cartridge. I don't know about all that. But one must admit that the release of the G20 in 1991, after the Smith & Wesson Model 1076 in 1990, was instrumental in solidifying the 10mm cartridge for shooters who wanted to adopt this cartridge. Well, as always, I am glad that you hung out with me. We need to do this more often, and I am working on that. Till we meet again, stay safe out there.